the EP Podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always at the eppodcast.com. Hey, welcome down to my basement. Some people call it the broadcast basement. This is all part of the Broadcast Basement On Demand Radio Network. See all the shows we do at BroadcastBasement.com. But belly on up to the 9-foot homemade oak bar. Pour yourself a cold one. The weekend is here, and this is the EP Podcast Weekend Update. It's all brought to you by the First National Bank of Evergreen Park, who knows that when you're working toward a financial goal, every little bit counts. And that's why when you open up a total access checking account, you get free ATMs nationwide and a $300 bonus, plus... You get great mobile and online banking tools. And when they talk about those free ATMs, that means when you use an ATM someplace and they charge you a fee, the First National Bank of Evergreen Park pays the fee for you. I don't know many banks that do that. You get easy access to your money, plus with that bonus, a little extra in the account. Open online at bankevergreenpark.com slash total access. $100 required to open. Requirements to qualify. Must use link to apply. Member FDIC, and remember that iconic building at 95th and Pulaski has the EP Podcast Car Magnet. Put it on the back of your vehicle. We are rewarding safe drivers all summer long, but also looking for those magnets. You can win big. Have it on the back of your vehicle. In addition to the normal weekend update, looking at everything going on in and around Evergreen Park, I wanted to have in a guest this week because the world is going upside down all over again. You can't go on social media without getting angry. Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, even all the AM radio stations are doing everything to put fear back into your life. And I want to separate fact from fiction, just like we did when the pandemic broke out over a year ago. Evergreen Park has done a great job of making decisions that make sense for Evergreen Park and not getting caught up in the big national discussion. This is a close community. It makes sense to try to figure out what's going on and how it really affects you right here in the EP and the surrounding area. So a guy that's been on, and I'm telling you, has been dead on in his assessment, in the way that he breaks down all the scientific data, and how he explains what's good, what's bad, what the numbers really mean when it comes to COVID-19, how the vaccinations work, what's safe, what isn't safe. Dr. David Beckman from Family First Medical Group right here in the EP, is going to be on the show in just a little bit, and we're going to have a candid discussion about the Delta variant, and vaccines, and masks, and the good, and the bad, and what's really going on here, and whether or not some of the things that came out this week even make sense. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's not what my plan was for this show, but it's something that we've been doing whenever the world starts to go upside down. Whenever things go sideways, we want to kind of bring an unbiased look with an actual person where you can go and see him walking down the street here in the EP who's an actual doctor and ask him questions to get real answers. That is coming up here on this show. Before it, we got your weather. This weekend, the Most Holy Redeemer Carnival is going on. It kicked off on Thursday night. And it will see a partly cloudy 74-degree day on Friday, an 82-degree partly cloudy day on Saturday, and a mostly sunny 76-degree beautiful Sunday for the carnival. little over a 20% chance of rain on Sunday. Hopefully, it stays away. On Monday, when you return to work, still in the 70s, which is great. We needed a break from this heat wave. And you'll be able to tune into Monday morning's episode of the EP Podcast, 30 Minutes of Good, catching up with everything going on in the village, Latest updates on all the events and news with Glenn Panuski from the Village of Evergreen Park. We have a good friend, Tom Mullally, from the EP Fire Department, who is also an auxiliary member of the U.S. Coast Guard, going to come in and have a talk with us. I know a lot of people are boating these days, going out on the water. He has some tips for you. And we have folks from District 124 schools, including the brand new superintendent, sitting here in studio They have a big announcement, a big event coming back for the kids, for the family, for the community. They will be on Monday's show as well. Remember, 
If you've ever missed an episode of the EP podcast, it's probably because you're not subscribed. You can do that anywhere podcasts can be found and get every single option on every single podcast player imaginable right through the EPPodcast.com. Imagine one day out of nowhere, you need your car towed. Who are you going to call? You have no idea. Right, because none of us think about that until it actually happens. So I'm going to give you a name, Dreamers Towing and Recovery. Located in Evergreen Park, Illinois, they will tow your vehicle locally or at a long distance at a very affordable price. What happens when your car needs a jump start? Dreamers Towing and Recovery. What happens when you're locked out of your car? Dreamers Towing and Recovery. You got a junk car, you don't know how to get rid of it, and you just want to move along and get some cash? They buy your junk cars. Covering the EP and the surrounding south side of Chicago, Dreamers is there when you need them with 24-hour service. Call them, 773-410-4549. 773-410-4549. Turn a sudden nightmare into a dream with Dreamers Towing and Recovery. Reserve your spot now, September 11th, 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. at Yukich Field for memories to go, the village-wide garage sale. It goes on rain or shine that day. You go in, you sell your stuff, you make some money, you get out. There are reservation fees. Check everything out at evergreenpark-ill.com. The Evergreen Park Police Department is looking for a few good officers and you have until 2 p.m. on Friday the 6th of August to apply. Starting salary just a hair over 66K, that's in the first year and then after that gets over $80,000 and after five years you're almost making a hundred grand. I'm telling you, I think a lot of you should be out there trying to get a job as a police officer in Evergreen Park. Get the application, the details, figure out how to hand it in evergreenpark-ill.com. And don't forget the next big concert going on that's free this summer in Circle Park at 97th and Homan is Rick Lindy and the Wild Ones Band. That is Sunday, August the 22nd, and it kicks off at 6 p.m. Dr. David Beckman, next. We're going to have a real discussion. We're going to ask real questions. We're going to get real answers, and we're going to cut out all of the noise surrounding COVID-19 and this crazy week in this country and focus on what's going on here in the EP and what matters most to you. This is the EP Podcast found everywhere podcasts can be found and always at the EPPodcast.com. I have a confession to make. It's true. And I'm guessing you have done the same thing. Put more time into thinking about what's for dinner than preparing for your retirement. But if you think your retirement needs deserve more attention, I agree with you. And I want to help you out. I've got a local, experienced, down-to-earth guy who's a friend of this show. He's got a get-to-know-you approach and do-the-right-thing values. And he's been around for over 20 years right here on the South Side. His name is Tom Walsh. He's located on the corner of 111th and Kedzie, and he's waiting for your call. In times of financial uncertainty, how can you stay on track? Call someone who's invested in your success. Reach out to Tom now, 773-779-0023, or pop in at the office right on 111th and Kedzie. Tell him we sent you. Edward Jones, making sense of investing, member SIPC. Joining me on the phone line right now, good friend of the show. He has been with us since before the outbreak of COVID-19. He has been on with us through every lockdown, every twist, every turn. Uh, I, I look forward to a day we can sit down and talk about other health issues with Dr. David Beckman, who is from Family First Medical Group right here in Evergreen Park. How are you, Doc? Doing well, Chris. I, I also hope that the next time that we talked was going to be not about coronavirus, but uh, here we are again. It's weird. And, and you know what? Here's the thing. I... I've had some I've had some thoughts over the last couple of days, especially with some of the things that have come out. And and I just traveled across the country, too. I, I went to the Outer Banks on a vacation and I went across seven different states and I saw how Americans in different states and different towns are acting. And it's very stark how different it is. I went into Fredericksburg, Virginia, and they had very angry signs up in the window that said it doesn't matter what the CDC said you have to wear a mask in this store. I would walk into other places 
And it was wide open. There wasn't anything that even said vaccinated, you don't have to wear one, unvaccinated, you do. The attitudes change county by county across this country, which is just incredible to me. And now what I'm seeing is the fear over the Delta variant. And we've talked about it on this show before. I think that the media, especially the mainstream media, they want to keep you angry, scared, because that kind of tension makes you go and click on their on their website and watch their television channels. It's how Facebook and Twitter operates. And, and it looks at everything from this big national perspective. And I kind of wanted to have you on for a minute to kind of explain what's going on this week, especially for everybody, because here in Evergreen Park, it may not be the same for all of us here as it is in some other part of the country. So what was your take First of all, in the CDC's announcement that it sounds like certain counties, not all, have to start. They they recommend that people that are vaccinated have to start putting masks back on. What did you think about that when you heard it? The first thing would be to to talk about the Delta variant, which so far the evidence, just like all of the other variants that we've seen so far, they show that this Delta variant is more transmissible, so it can be passed more easily between people. But... It is not any more deadly or fatal than any of the uh, previous variants with COVID. You know, I think keeping that in perspective is is important, um, especially in the context of vaccination, because the reality is that the vaccines have worked incredibly well, um, and they continue to work uh, very well. We we need to emphasize that, and I think when the when the CDC comes out. And, may, and issues that regardless of patient status, you need to wear a mask, it again creates doubt and fear and uh, uncertainty. And and so, so now you have people that are vaccinated who thought, well, I thought if I got a vaccine, everything was good. And now it seems like these guidelines kind of fall into question. So, uh, that, that belief. Tell me if I'm wrong here, because I'm just kind of curious. I think a lot of people are in the same boat that I'm in, where the people around me who I love, who especially those that were at risk, have all become vaccinated, and that I have my vaccine, and my wife has hers. Even those that have the vaccine for their children or don't have the vaccine for their children, where it's still a very minuscule number of children get affected by this disease, the people that are in the this boat where those that that definitely need the vaccine, those that are at risk, all these people, and they've been feeling comfortable over the last couple of months. I don't feel any less comfortable with the news this week. Like, I don't feel like there's there's any chance that I'm going to end up dead any more than I would have ended up dead a a month or two ago. Uh, that, uh, That my family should be fine because we followed the idea of, hey, you know what? There's something out there. Here's the chances you could die from it. Here's the chances you could be seriously hospitalized from it. We made a decision about vaccinations. We feel safe. We're good. I'm not worried anymore, right? I mean, like, is there any reason now why somebody like me or a family like me should be more concerned today than we were a week or two ago? Uh, absolutely not. I think that your your uh, interpretation is the interpretation that I would hope most of the country um, yeah, uses. I mean, I think that that is, that is the correct conclusion. The, what we see is that the majority of the people that are hospitalized and, and die right now are people that have not had a vaccine. And so we know, we understand right now that by getting a vaccine, especially if you are at higher risk, is going to significantly lower your risk of complications. And if you and if you do that, then you really don't have to worry. And I think that um, that is the message that should be conveyed. And we, we also, I think, need to be critical of the, uh, the CDC and the, and the way that they're making these guidelines, because from what I've uh, read and, and looked at, there was actually no scientific data that was cited for the change in um, in recommendations. The only thing that they were basing these guidelines on was that there were a few observations of patients who had vaccines that still had a high viral load of COVID in their nasal passages. They were not symptomatic, 
but they were carrying a high viral load. And so they jumped to the conclusion that because they had a vaccine and they had a high viral load, that they likely were asymptomatic spreaders. And so if there is higher community transmission um, and you have people that are vaccinated, you still have to take those precautions because of a potential of asymptomatic spread. But that has not been demonstrated at all um, in the real world. It was, I think, probably a premature conclusion that they came to because they saw rising case rates because of the Delta variant. And I think they got a little bit worried and maybe were put under some pressure to act and do something. Uh, but, but a lot of times what you, what you realize in medicine that a lot of times doing nothing is better than doing something. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious of your, your take on, or at least what you're telling your patients now over a family first medical group, you know, cause I'm sure you have people that are asking you questions. Cook County when they put out the big map, and it's really crazy, I've seen this map now twice in the last 24 hours of the counties that would fall under the new CDC guidelines and the counties that actually don't need to have vaccinated people put on masks according to the CDC recommendations. In both of the maps, Cook County is fine. It doesn't actually say to Cook County, like the, the order itself has nothing to do with us where we live. Because right now, Cook County is doing well. There's a couple of other, like I saw variations in counties just in Illinois, where one map said that they were and one map said that they weren't. But I mean, are you basically telling your people like, hey, I know what you're reading on the news right now. Keep doing what you're doing because we're we're not in we're not even falling under this order right now. Are you saying something along those lines? How are you interpreting it and explaining it to your patients? Well, I, I think that to begin with, those maps, uh, I believe, are, are flawed because they're, they're just looking at cases. And, um, and I, I think that there's always been, the, the cases have always been problematic for a variety of reasons. Right now, I think the biggest issues with following cases are number one, that the majority of people that are, uh, are getting infected are younger, so inherently lower risk. And number two, uh, cases are positive, um, a positive PCR test, which um, in many people, uh, they'll have a positive PCR test and have no symptoms. And in many people, they'll have a positive PCR test and you have no idea whether they're actually infectious or contagious. So I think looking at cases as a metric for how a community is doing is not a great measure. I think you have to look at hospitalizations. And so if you look at the hospitalizations in the area and if you start seeing that the capacity in the hospitals is starting to rise, then you start to get a little bit more concerned. And I think in that, in those cases, it's probably more, it, it makes more sense to be a little bit more cautious. But what I tell patients when they come in is, hey, if you get a vaccine, you don't have to worry. And whether you want to wear a mask or not, it doesn't really matter. If you want to go places where they're requiring you to wear a mask, you wear a mask. Uh, if you want to go places and they're saying it's optional and you don't want to wear a mask and you have a vaccine, then no worries. You don't have to worry about that. And I, and I also say the same about uh, young, healthy kids in general, because uh, that, that's also been a sore spot too. It's, well, what about kids who can't get vaccinated right now? And the reality is that driving in the car for a kid to go get a vaccine is higher risk than a kid dying from uh, from COVID. So that I think is is something that a lot of parents still don't know. A lot of parents still don't know that in the last year there have been more kids that have died under 18 that have died from pneumonia than they have from COVID. Um, a lot of parents don't know that on on average there are more kids that die from flu than they do from COVID. These are statistics that the public isn't generally aware of. And so I think when I see patients in the office, I try to educate them about that, especially in parents who are concerned about putting their kids in school. You know, I, I definitely encourage them to uh, mask or not uh, for their kids that they definitely should be in school and they should do everything that they can to get them back into school. Let's get into that real quick, because I'm very curious about your thoughts on it. The uh, Right here in Evergreen Park, 
we have uh, several different things that are going on with the schools. The uh, Evergreen Park High School has basically announced their their mitigation things, what they're going to do, but they have yet to talk about what they're doing with masks. We're going to have the superintendent of District 124 on for a big announcement that has nothing to do with COVID-19 and mitigation. But trust me, I'm going to ask her about what they're planning on doing with masks. We have uh, the Archdiocese of Chicago coming out and saying kids that are vaccinated and personnel don't need to wear one and they've yet to decide what their guidance is going to be for unvaccinated children. So this is going to become a thing here on the south side of Chicago, especially in this area where we live at. So what you just said was very interesting to me, and I want to bring up another stat. Tell me if it's true or not. There's a lot of parents that are concerned about some of the side effects from the Pfizer vaccine. And I had somebody point this out to me the other day. I'm not going to say this stat because I want people to be afraid of getting vaccinated. Because I'm not an anti-vaxxer in any way. But there is a stat out that one out of every 100,000 children in the last three months have been hospitalized as a result of COVID-19, where six out of every 100,000 children who have gotten the Pfizer uh, vaccine have ended up with this enlarged heart thing. Have you heard anything about this? Have you read anything on this? Have you had parents ask you about vaccinating their kids, and what are you telling them? Yeah, the, the vaccinations for for kids, so under 18, um, there, there definitely are uh, links to myocarditis and pericarditis um, especially in boys. So what you see is that boys under 18 who get their second dose of either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine um, have a significantly higher risk than average, like the average population, of getting myocarditis or per- pericarditis. And now we have to be careful about what does significant mean. So if you look at the general population, out of 100,000 kids under 18, you would expect to see four, about four people get myocarditis out of 100,000 from various different viruses. After the second COVID vaccine, especially for boys, um, that rate is actually 100 for 100,000. So, so because of that, I think that Again, where the CDC um, failed, in my opinion, was that they had a meeting about this, and they and they did and they did say that there is a link between um, myocarditis and the mRNA vaccines, especially in boys. There's a little bit higher rates in girls, but not as high as in boys. And unfortunately, they did not look at any positive vaccine schedule. So, for example, they didn't look at what the the rates of myocarditis or infection would be, they didn't consider the rate of one mRNA vaccine for boys or even the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for boys. They didn't look at alternative vaccine schedules um, in their recommendations, which I think was a mistake because actually the mRNA vaccine, if you get one vaccine, you're about 80% protected, which is pretty pretty darn good, um, especially in an age group that's already low risk. And if you look at what other countries have done, like England, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, they have actually come out and they've recommended that kids under 18 that are healthy, that have no medical problems and are not obese, uh, that the vaccine should, should um, should be optional, should be optional. And you consider vaccinating that age group only if they have some underlying medical problems or if they're if they're obese, and, and it's strictly because of the myocarditis pericarditis rate. The statistics that you stated before, the rate of hospitalization for teenagers um, or for kids, one out of a hundred thousand with COVID versus six out of a hundred thousand uh, post vaccine. That that is the correct statistic, um, and uh, and so. You know, those rates are obviously very low for both of them, but I think that's why you have to do a cost versus benefit analysis. I mean, six out of 100,000 compared to one out of 100,000, they're both very low. But the thing is, if you have a healthy teen and they end up being one of the teenagers that gets a second dose and gets myocarditis, and for example, they're an athlete, 
then they then they actually can't compete in sports, even if they recover, which thankfully the majority of these kids do recover. Even if they recover, they can't compete in sports after an episode of myocarditis for three to six months. So it really can affect their uh, their future, um, you know, athletic career and uh, and schooling career too. So I think it's totally normal and, and advised for parents to say, you know what, maybe we wait, or maybe if we're really worried, we just give one shot, or maybe we wait and see if there are um, other vaccines that are available um, for for teenagers. I think that that is a reasonable um, a reasonable point of view, and I tell that to parents. I say there there isn't a clear indication right now that a healthy kid needs to go out and get a vaccine for COVID at this point. So in the end, and I just kind of want to I want to make sure, and if there's something that we missed here, you, you jump in and let me know. In the end, what we're ba- what we basically talked about here is we have this other variant. The variant itself is more transmissible, but there's nothing that shows that the variant is more deadly. Uh, when we're counting cases, we're not doing a very good job of representing what's going on. We should be looking at the hospitalizations and whether or not hospitals are getting overloaded. And that people that are vaccinated are just as safe today as they were a month or two ago while they were vaccinated. Children are at an incredibly low rate, even unvaccinated. Yeah, I think you said the stat that you have a better chance of your child dying in the car accident on the way to the vaccine than actually dying of COVID-19 if they didn't get vaccinated. I think that was one of the things that you said. Yep. And that there are some concerns when it comes to young people that other countries have actually made decisions about how they're vaccinating children that is different from what the CDC and what the United States is doing. So there, you know, and, and that's I think that's the one thing that I wanted to make sure I, I highlighted from what you said because... I feel like any parent these days who says openly, I'm not sure about this, they get attacked. Yes. And and it's not that they're an anti-vaxxer. It's because they're actually looking at the data that you just talked about on the show. 100%. Yeah, that was a perfect summary. And yeah, and, you know, the thing about vaccines for kids is you want to, you want the benefits of vaccination to clearly outweigh any of the risks. And because there has been such a small group of 12 to 15 year olds that were uh, evaluated for the vaccine, waiting makes sense. In fact, the FDA actually advised Pfizer to recruit more people for more kids for their trial in kids under 12, because they need to be able to make sure that they're detecting the possibility of any adverse events. So, Thankfully, um, it seems like they are doing their their due diligence with wanting to make sure that if they're going to recommend a vaccine for kids under 12, that it really has a robust population and, and it has enough data in order to make some good, um, draw some solid conclusions about adverse events. All right. Well, I'm going to continue enjoying my life then. Okay, Doc, because uh, at this point, I, that sounds good. I, you know, I mean, I just, I, I kind of feel like if you're, if you're worried and you're, and you're not vaccinated, go, go get vaccinated. And if you're vaccinated, you shouldn't be stressed as much as they want you to be stressed about what's going on right now. And I appreciate you jumping on the show. I know there's events all over the South side and I don't want anybody all of a sudden to sit there and think to themselves, Oh my gosh, I got to go lock myself inside the house and start hoarding toilet paper again and ordering out all of my food and uh, and wiping everything down rigorously that comes anywhere within 15 feet of my home. So I don't want anybody going off the deep end. I think you're going to keep us in the shallow end of the pool. Thank you very much, Dr. David Beckman, for joining us here today. Thank you. That's your weekend update. Remember, you can reach out to us with comments and questions for our guest or for us. There is a way to leave a voicemail with any device. Look for the little blue microphone in the bottom right-hand corner at the eppodcast.com. Click on it or just shoot us a message through the message board at that website. Have a great weekend, everybody. Get out to the carnival. Bye-bye. Another show is wrapped up. Another show's in the books. Another show is wrapped up. And then by the looks, it's going to be a good one. And we'll see you next week. And the nude is there. Another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, and it's in the books, 
Another show is wrapped up, another show is wrapped up, and by the looks, it's gonna be a good one. Ooh, it is basement, oh, broadcast basement. The nudist basement, the broad basement. Slancha. The EP podcast. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at the eppodcast.com.